Let's start by talking about the uh, Equator Tower. Mm -hmm. So Kuala Lumpur, mm -hmm. why is the Equator Tower so well suited for Kuala Lumpur? Describe the building and what it, makes it fit. It, it's really the, the result of three different factors. I mean, one, obviously it's on the equator, so you have the unusual situation. Well, to those of us who live in the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, mm -hmm. the unusual situation that, that the conditions on the North and the South of the building are at various times of the year equivalent. And so that gives you the opportunity to make a highly performative building in terms of sun shading that is actually uniform. Um, the second is that the building, its intent was to house uh, traders who were going to be using the building day and night. And because of the, the severe climate, if you were to use a heavily tinted or reflective glass or both, the problem with that is uh, in the evenings, it effectively becomes a mirror on the interior. And so if you had traders who were going to work the I don't know, 8 o'clock till 4 o'clock in the morning shift, they would effectively be sitting in, in an opaque room with no view at all. It kind mm -hmm. of uh, defeats the purpose of being on the 60th floor of a tower. Mm -hmm. um, and the third had to do with the fact that it was a Muslim country. Um, and uh, so the call to prayer obviously overloads elevators if you're attempting to bring the population mm -hmm. out of the building to something that may be at grade uh, for mm -hmm. prayer. And so we Up to five times a day. Up to five times a day. And so we created these very, very large prayer floors um, at, at equipoints through the height of the building, very much the way you would uh, maybe not such a nice relationship, or, or to call it that way, but the way you would also do mechanical plant. Mm -hmm. you, know, you put mechanical plant equally divided, and that mm -hmm. then you're servicing up and down, and you can reduce the overall core. Um, so a similar idea of, of bringing people to these prayer floors would allow us to reduce the stress mm -hmm. on the elevators. And so the, the combination of, of wanting to have the ideal of a totally transparent building at night plus the fact that we had these very large prayer floors that allowed us to create a unique geometry hmm. meant that we could implement this idea of a retractable skin, something that would go from the larger prayer floor and then get retracted to where it touches the tower. Um, and so that, that it was very much, although it's a, hard to say that it is a contextual building, um, it's very much of its context and of its, of its um, use and its demand. Do you say it's not contextual just because it's a high rise in a hot climate? Or yeah, I mean, it, it certainly has nothing that you could call traditional architecture. It's not vernacular it's Malaysian, not vernacular. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are these prayer for floors like? Because that sounds interesting to me. And what, uh, how could they be adapted to other projects that say they're not used for prayer, but I would imagine that you could have a similar sort of integration of either public space or otherwise programmed space throughout an office tower like that? We're actually doing a project in... Perth that sort of uses that same concept. It, you know, it's not, not for prayer, but uh, it's a multi-use building um, in the new, uh, they're, they're trying to draw the central business district towards the water. Like, you know, most cities around the world, they had neglected their, their waterlands and, and now mm -hmm. they're trying to draw the cities to them. Uh, and so we're doing a, a quote signature tower that's right on the waterfront to sort of stake a claim to that, to that shift towards the waterfront. Um, and it's a mixed-use building, and a combination of uh, offices, hotel, and residences. And the other towers around it have a very similar program mix. And, and so we, we argued that in order to make the building distinguish itself, um, and also in a way compete with its neighbors who all had a very, very similar massing strategy of putting all the public elements at grade, to actually take those public elements and put them up in the middle of the building. Hmm. Um, and similarly, then you can have the, the population of the building aggregating to the mi middle, um, but also the intent of shuttling the public up to that uh, sort of interstitial, um, we would call it the plus. Ha happens to have a plus shape, but hmm. so it became branded the plus. How do you make sure that people actually use it? Because for the most part, we, people don't expect to be able yeah. to go up to the middle of the building it's, like that. It's a, it's a great and valid question. Um, Fortunately, there's now a uh, rather significant precedence all over Asia. It's mm -hmm. become a rather typical um, typology in Asia that uh, you will have a greeter at the front desk, but you check in and the restaurant and everything is at the top of the building, and then you sift down. Mm -hmm. um, and in the context of this building, there's also a fairly significant population, day and night population, that would use the building and use those, uh, those amenities. And so that we, the intent would be, or hope would be that that enough and its visibility within the city is enough to, to draw the public. Mm 
Um, but for the most part, with the exception of, of the high-end restaurant, uh, which would presumably depend somewhat on public use. The rest is anyway really intended, or let's say it would certainly benefit from, from the general public's access, but it's, it's uh, pro forma is based on the occupants of the building. Tell us about the R6 project in mm -hmm. Seoul and what makes that a noteworthy project. What should other people be interested to see in that project? <laughs> it's, it's the world's largest single loaded corridor. Um, you know, it it's basically takes a what is conventionally thought of as a very um, pedestrian American motel typology and then puts it on steroids and tries to make something remarkable out of it. Hmm. The, the project is unusual in that you know, we, we were literally the project on the wrong side of the tracks. The, the whole development sits over the train tracks um, uh, in the center of Seoul. And it was an uncomfortable um, collaboration between private development and, and state-owned mm -hmm. entities. And in the process, they were going to take over a whole element of uh, low-income but owned residences along mm -hmm. the waterfront in order to bring that development to the waterfront. Um, and you can owned imagine, by the tenants, owned by the, owned, the owned residents. By the, owned by the residents. And you can imagine the public outcry when suddenly people's homes were getting demolished for you know, eminent domain, when in reality it was for a for-profit developer, a private mm -hmm. entity. Uh, and so the developer's proposal was to have us make, as I said, the project on the wrong side of the tracks, literally. You know, mm -hmm. The whole development was on one side and we were on the other side of the train tracks. Mm -hmm. um, in which the residents who would be displaced would be given micro units within our building. And perhaps, or I should say, quite cynically, they recognized that those residents would never be able to pay the, the property taxes. Mm. So they would get them, but then have to flip them immediately. Mm. So that, in a way, the building would then go back mm. to being part of the overall development and of sort of luxury apartments and condos. And we therefore had to come up with a strategy that could make credible high-end micro units. Mm. Um, and in, in Korea, the, the sale of units, are, it's very regulated, and which is a, a great thing. I think the, the way it's done actually, unfortunately, just puts an enormous amount of new stock that's unnecessary into the market, but mm. um, they, they regulate the prices, and so developers must compete on uh, natural ventilation, cross-ventilation, views, daylight access, um, as well as a sense of community within the buildings. So, it, so it, the intent is that it actually drives good architecture. Mm -hmm. um, what was interesting about the problem we had is that once you make micro units, they, they can almost have none of the above. Right? They're too, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you take a core and you put tiny units around the core, they're going to have no cross ventilation, no view, no mm -hmm. daylight. Mm -hmm. um, no connectivity. No connectivity. And so we, we made the world's biggest single loaded corridor. And we, we took that building and sort of stretched it out and put the cores at either end and wrap them in a, in a donut around that. And so the units are incredibly thin, have daylight on both sides, cross ventilation. And, um, hmm. and there's also these kind of unique elements on the interior of the courtyard, um, little glass pods. And it was simply us playing with a, a loophole within the, the regulations of, of the site that you were not um, punished within the FAR for amenity space. Um, and there was also a loophole in the definition of circulation. So we could create these little pods that were ostensibly part of the circulation and were also amenity mm -hmm. that we could station all over that, that central courtyard atrium mm -hmm. uh, without it having any detrimental effect. to the These overall. are like balconies or what are they? They're, they're effectively they're gl glassed in balconies. Yeah. Um, but because the units were so small, it was important to create relief and to create, you know, move people into the center of the building. And so they were this kind of unusual hanging hmm. garden of people throughout the, the entire center. So it was what you described earlier, what happened? Did they end up having to sell their homes immediately because they couldn't afford um, the property well, taxes? The good news is no. The good news is the development stopped. Um, <laughs> uh, there were fights between Korean Rail and, and you know, all the, the major players in, in yeah. Korea about who was going to fund what, and eventually it, it stopped. And, um, so while we were disappointed, I think, with the personal result, it actually, once we understood really what we were engaged in doing and supporting, hmm. it made us feel a lot better that it hmm. didn't actually happen. Interesting. Um, is that a concept, though, that you'd like to apply elsewhere? 
Um, you know, we're pretty agnostic about the ideas that we generate, meaning if if there's a, a new situation that seems to, to demand it, great. But it's very much, in both the projects I've described, the, we believe in what I often call um, critical naivete, that, hmm. that you approach a problem critically and, and with also almost a, an intentional lack of, of understanding of convention. Um, to see if it will generate something that is very uh, performative but unusual. Hmm. Um, and so in both those instances, they're really a product of the situation we were engaged in. And if another situation like it arose, great. But if it didn't, I don't think we would attempt to simply transport it for the sake of, hey, it's cool, and we'll mm -hmm. try it someplace else. So both the projects you've been talking about, R6 and the Equator mm -hmm. Tower, are both very responsive to some of the particular needs of the tenants. Mm -hmm. How do you go about assessing the needs of your future tenants? Because in some cases, you don't know what they'll mm -hmm. be. They may be at odds with each other if mm -hmm. it's a mixed-use building. What's mm -hmm. your process for that? Um, it depends on the project. It depends on how we've, we've gained the commission. Um, obviously, in a competition, you don't have that luxury. And mm -hmm. um, fortunately, most of our work is not done through direct competition. At least it's not. You know, to the extent we do competitions, it's directly with the developer and the brief is, uh, the brief, the user, everyone is really accessible to us. Um, when we don't have that luxury, then we, we literally, in our minds, try to become the proxy user. And sometimes we'll even engage a proxy user. You know, for a museum, it's totally off the topic of CTPUH, but in a museum, sure. we'll often engage um, uh, a museum director, a museum curator, to to act as a foil for the ideas that we're trying to generate. Um, for a project in which we have the the owner and or user accessible to us during design, which is the way we much prefer to work, um, the difficulty with competitions is precisely that you you're designing without engagement. Yeah. Um, then we we ask the the owners to, to give us the luxury of what we call a thinking phase, to actually suspend design for up to three months hmm. and to just work through these kinds of issues with them. Now, the reality is we tend to be designing and playing in the background. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're constantly correlating ideas and issues that are coming out of that with potential solutions. But um, what we've discovered, and I think why we have been able to convince subsequent clients to continue this idea is that the, the clients with whom we've already done it will attest that it actually can accelerate the process. Hmm. That yes, you, you don't have that immediate rush to design that everybody wants. They're, you know, everyone's excited, they're also stressed, they want to get it going. And so to ask, you know, hey, let's slow down, let's think, um, there's often a lot of resistance to that. But once the project's uh, issues have been really, really clarified, and everyone can articulate them, and everyone can debate them, and understands, you know, on the same page what what you're trying to do. You know, often described the, the trail of tears that happens about a year into many projects. If you don't do this, is that suddenly the owner finally understands what it is you've ostensibly agreed to, and goes, "Oh, wait a minute," right? right? And then the whole thing has to be unraveled, and that is obviously takes a lot more time and a lot more expense, and so. What we've discovered is that by taking the time to think with our clients in advance, we can actually move through conventional design phases with much greater ease and, and um, collegiality and mm -hmm. success. Mm -hmm. And so the project actually moves quite swiftly. You know, mm -hmm. It sort of gains mm -hmm. speed and then goes very, very fast because everything can be discussed and, uh, with great precision. And what do you actually do during that thinking phase? It totally depends on, on the kind of project. Um, Often we're doing a pretty intensive programmatic review. Um, we like to go see precedents with the owner. Um, often there's no literal precedent because we're trying to do something new, but so we'll go see things that you might aggregate together. You could say, you know, take a piece of this and this and this might start to look like some form of precedent. Mm -hmm. But actually uh, visiting precedents is less about necessarily learning from them, but creating a common language with the owner. So when you start putting ideas before them, once you get into design, you can say, hey, do you remember what we saw in this building? Do you remember your reaction to it? And maybe it was favorable, maybe it wasn't. Um, it, it allows you to make reference points that everybody hmm. knows. Um, 
uh, and then the third thing that we've done, which typically only in cultural projects, um, is to have uh, a series of seminars that we curate and we bring people from all different uh, viewpoints on whatever it is we're investigating and some will be um, in favor of certain kinds of ambitions and some people will be, you know, in terms of technology, we'll, we'll try and get people who are visionaries in terms of technology and we'll try and bring Luddites who <laughs> fear what could happen with technology in terms of the digital divide and allow them to help not necessarily, well, to a degree, if you're lucky, it'll help you frame what position you'll take. Um, but it also, I think, gives everyone a sense of confidence that when you move forward, you haven't um, irresponsibly ignored something. And so you, mm -hmm. you, can, you know why you're doing it, and you can, you can justify why you chose not to do things with much greater clarity mm -hmm. than, than you would otherwise be able to do. And so we try to do all three of those things. And of course, they, they feed on each other. The yeah. program review informs what you might go see, but then when you might go see and the kinds of seminars mm -hmm. we hold goes back and edits the program. And um, So it, it ends up being a pretty intensive period. And it's probably obvious why then, once you start designing, it actually can move quite quickly. Mm -hmm. What are some architectural trends that you find exciting or interesting? Keeping in mind that you, know, you said you take each project individually, of mm -hmm. course, but are there broader trends that you find Encouraging or exciting as an architect? I, you know, I, I think that many my my interests are all over the place. Um, you know, there there are people who are rethinking buildings not as assemblies but as you know sort of unified wholes. So you know, instead of uh, a kind of industrialized revolution approach to architecture of you know we have a mullion and then we have glass and you know they each has its own purpose and its own materiality and it's, you know, they're aggregated in, in this assemblage. Mm. Um, people who are pioneering um, the idea of growing, and I don't mean literally, I mean, so you could say it's, we're no longer in the industrial age, we're in the biological age. And to some degree, there are people who are investigating literally growing, but sure. there are also people like Neri Oxman at, at the MIT Media Lab um, who are, by whatever means of, of production possible creating systems that are continuous, that something might go from being um, stiff and opaque and non-porous to being malleable, transparent, and porous, and that the continuum changes based on whatever it needs to do at that particular moment. And um, you know, the things that she's producing are completely putting our profession on its head. Like what? Um, it, you know, some of the things are, are quite nascent. So she's working on, on glass printing um, with the idea that you would be able to do anything from um, uh, printing uh, glass both as a, a structural element and also obviously as a transparent element, but that you could also create micro fissures in it that you could uh, entrain um, uh, bio bioorganisms within it that could react to the sunlight. Hmm. Um, so this is 3D printed glass? It, it is, and, and um, I, I know her well. I know that she would, she doesn't want to be known as the 3D printing person. It's just uh -huh. that 3D printing at this point is the, the, the means that is sure. most, um, in terms of non-biological processes, but that can still create something that is a, a whole, not with parts. It's the technique that is best suited to it at present, um, but she, I don't think she has any interest in sure. 3D printing. Itself. So is that something that you think about for designing buildings then, thinking of a building as, as a whole, although obviously um, it's going to be composed of individual parts? I, How does that influence you as an architect? I, I don't know that it influences me. I mean, if anything, my career is a much more traditional one. You know, I hope that we're, we're pushing boundaries with an architecture. Um, and that would definitely be our aim. But I think she's changing architecture as we're pushing boundaries. You know? So it's hard for me to say that, sure. that there's anything that we are literally applying. But how do you think that'll change the field then if you go forward you know, a couple decades or something? Do you see this? How do you see it changing architecture? Well, I, I think it could literally change how we perceive the, the built environment as a whole.